After the collapse of the Soviet empire in the late 1980s and early 1990s, there was a famous American socialist economist by the name of Robert Heilbronner who famously admitted in the New Yorker magazine in September of 1990 that Mises was right all along about the impossibility of a socialist economy. So good on him for admitting that central planning had failed economically. But here's where the red flag is, literally, because he then said that we need to, quote, rethink the meaning of socialism. And he still did not endorse capitalism, but rather he advocated for his fellow socialists to turn to regulation, particularly environmental regulation under the guise of saving the planet. He said that regulation could be just as effective as government ownership of the means of production. He said that they should, quote, highlight the ecological burden that economic growth is placing on the environment, and also that they should say that markets may be better at allocating resources, but only socialism could avoid ecological disaster. Please go look this up. This is real, and I'm pretty angry about it. John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. I'll tell you what, speaking very honestly about this, as I always do, but if we're really going to take the gloves off, I am so angry with all of the young people I've seen this week outside protesting about the climate crisis. And I don't usually get angry about these types of things. It's typically more of an annoyance. But I'm looking at the pictures that are being posted on social media by people that I know. And they're holding signs that say, capitalism kills, socialist alternative. And it's like, are you a f***ing idiot? I mean that since I'm truly asking. Because these kids aren't even socialists. They don't even know what socialism is. Because you've got the people that protest for everything, right? But then you've also got the people who are usually apathetic. But they'll go to a climate crisis protest because they've been told that the world is ending. And also going to protest is a fashion for these people nowadays. It looks good for them. It helps their image. It's good for their brand. It makes them look virtuous and caring. And I've been thinking about this a lot all day today because I was playing Hearts of Iron 4 last night. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's this World War II grand strategy game. And one of the things that you can do in the game is promote propaganda to convince people to support your agenda. And so I'm going in between, you know, seeing these posts on social media and then trying to establish communism in Britain. And I just sort of had this realization of like, I can imagine someone attending that protest and then going home and playing a game where you're in control of a country and you can promote propaganda. And I can just imagine these people being like, Wow, crazy how that used to happen, huh? Crazy the things used to be like that. Wow, you know, sure, it's a good thing they don't do that anymore. And I'm like, I'm blown away by the ignorance. I am blown away by the fact that we have a well-documented history of millions and millions of people being seduced into socialism through lies and propaganda and then being slaughtered like cattle. That we have the socialists admitting in writing, yeah, our ideas don't really work and it sucks that people found out about it, but we're just going to rebrand it as environmentalism. That we've got a bill, a Green New Deal, that was introduced into our Congress by a woman who self-identifies as a democratic socialist, which just means a socialist without absolute power as far as I can tell. And then in that plan, which her chief of staff was caught admitting wasn't even about the climate in the first place. This $93 trillion plan is packed full of full employment pledges, income for people simply unwilling to work. I mean, why do you think it's called the Green New Deal? Do you even know what the New Deal is? Does that mean anything to you? It's a nod to FDR's New Deal, which was somewhat similar in nature. Lots of wealth redistribution, lots of regulations. Oh, well, it stopped the Great Depression. No, no, it did not. It extended the Great Depression which was caused in the first place by market intervention. It's so easy to be a leftist. It's just the gift that keeps on giving. Hey, let's regulate the, oh, oh no, it's acting up. Well, I guess it's because we didn't regulate it enough in the first place. And I love when they're just like, um, if you're against socialism, you're actually against social security. Check. It's like, yeah, correct. You are correct. And all of this happens. We've got this bill now. They know about the history of the propaganda. They know about the ideology. We've got them admitting that they're going to rebrand it as environmentalism. And then they're like, no way, because the world is like actually going to end. I check Instagram. I see this girl's story from her dorm room, the wall. She's got a poster of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez that says notorious AOC. There's articles like ah, growing up with a climate crisis is so overwhelming. I mean, how many tweets have you seen? Like I was going to study for my test, but the world's ending anyway. So I guess I'll watch Netflix. How dare you call yourself Generation Z? You are not a real Zoomer. Zoomer is not given at birth. It is earned. There's a term for people like you. You are a useful idiot. If you fail to connect these pieces of information, you are an idiot. But not all of them are, you know, because lots of them know this. They don't actually care. They're actually in favor of whatever it takes to implement their ideology because the ends justify the means. People like you, people who fail to connect the dots because it makes them uncomfortable. They don't like the anxiety they get realizing that the government exists to expand itself and to assert more power over them. No, no, no. Better if we could just binge watch Netflix knowing that, oh, the world is ending, but I've done my part to help by forfeiting my rights to the government. Or maybe they don't like the anxiety of not being 
a sheep and I don't know, maybe thinking for yourself. It's those types of people that allow for this to continue to manifest until people like us, the dissenters, the people who speak out against this from happening, because we know the history, we know the value of freedom, the value of our rights. It's people like those that get people like us shot. Cannot be reasoned with. They're just following orders. Wait, sir, please don't put a bullet in my head. I promise I'll pledge allegiance to the party. No, it's over. Everything goes black because you're dead now, or maybe you starve to death. All because people fail to accept responsibility and fail to use their brains because they preferred to distract themselves with meaningless endeavors in an attempt to find any sort of meaning in their pathetic lives. And that's your fault, or so they've decided. And so now you have to die because you have the wrong opinions. You don't share the goal of the society, therefore you must die. I want to be friends with you. I want to play kickball, but I can't because you're going to get me killed. Please just listen. We both agree on these things. You know, it's like, just reason it through. You're going to these protests advocating for socialism because you're against income inequality. You don't like that the elites have large concentrations of wealth and the average American doesn't. Here's the thing. Under socialism, it's the same thing. You've got the elites who live in luxury, but the difference is that everyone who isn't part of that class lives in total poverty. If you live in America in the 21st century, you don't know what poverty is by any standard of history. Why do you think all of the elites are coming out in favor of ending this, this climate catastrophe? Why would any elite be in support of implementing an economic system that removes them from the elite class? They wouldn't. Well, but then why would they say they support it? Because they're lying to you. Under socialism, the elites live well while you and your family are starving. Under environmentalism, the elites fly in private jets to come tell you why it's not ecological for you to drive a car anymore. What's the parallel there? Well, it's that the elites think they're better than you. They think they're smarter than you. They think that they're the ones that should be able to organize society while exempting themselves from their own standards because they know that it will allow them to live well while you are held down. That's why capitalism, the most effective system for pulling people out of poverty, is the enemy of both socialism and environmentalism. Hint, there's no both. Environmentalism is just a 21st century Trojan horse for socialism because as they've even admitted, socialism has gotten something of a bad rep because it's such a demonstrable failure. But capitalism exploits the environment. No, it doesn't. And we'll talk about that in a second, but again, you have to conform to environmentalism or else you're a science denier. You deny science. The science is settled. Hey, didn't Albert Einstein say that the most important thing is to never stop questioning? I don't know, but I guess now you have to go to a re-education camp where we can teach you the correct opinions. Oh, okay, sounds good. Hey, what happens if you disagree with socialism while living under it? Oh, the same thing? Gotcha. But the most alarming one, in my opinion, is that they justify the sacrifice in the name of the greater good. Advocates of environmentalism want subsidized abortion so that we can kill people so as to slow population growth and save the planet. Socialists killed tens of millions of people in the name of the greater good. And as I found myself saying a lot recently, it's because leftist ideology is collective. It's not about the individual. And because of that, it's not about the rights of the individual. These are symptoms of socialism taken to its logical and moral conclusion. These aren't symptoms of socialism gone wrong. So a bit heated there, but within reason, right? So, I mean, that's why in Europe they call the Green Party the watermelons because they're green on the outside and they're red on the inside. So we'll talk about the fundamental misguidance of environmentalism as opposed to capitalism. Um, and so the first thing you have to understand is that whenever something is produced, <coughs> excuse me, something else is destroyed, roughly speaking, right? And so agricultural production clears forests, industrial production pollutes the atmosphere. Yeah, we can all agree there. So granted that all production results in some form of environmental damage, and you can chart the varying degrees of it, but given that, the question isn't what economic system does the least damage, but rather which system damages the most efficiently. Or in other words, which system provides for us the most benefit for the least amount of damage. And they say that capitalism hurts the environment, therefore socialism. And first of all, every time that we've done the therefore socialism in the past, millions of people died and the environment was trashed, but uh, more on that in a second. <laughs> The point is that a system through which there is zero environmental damage just does not exist. So the question is not about total damage, but rather proportionate damage. It's about efficiency. And now remember the first thing that we talked about, which was the socialist admitting that central planning is not efficient. And obviously anyone could look at any history book ever and know that, but it felt rewarding to hear him say it, to be honest with you. But the point is that because the economic system is inherently inefficient, it's going to be inherently more destructive to the environment because they're going to be doing greater damage to the environment for less of a return than what the free market would award. And again, we'll go over the specific historical examples of this in just a second, but the bottom line is that given that this damage and waste will always exist, the question is not how do we get rid of it, the question is how do we manage it? 
And the answer to that question is you create a society that is wealthy and innovative enough to be able to manage that waste. And the way to do that is to allow innovation and wealth to be created through the best and most efficient system that we have, which is the free market. Free market countries tend to be cleaner. They tend to be, you know, have better air quality, better water quality than socialist countries. That's not a coincidence. That is pure cause and effect. And that's because one of the fundamental components of capitalism, and arguably the most important one, is the existence of property rights, private property and the protection of property rights. But with property ownership comes something just as important, which is liability. And property owners understand the benefits of ownership, but also that they're responsible for any costs that their property imposes on others. So if you're driving your car, you're responsible for the damages caused by crashing into another person's car if there's a system in place that protects people's rights. And we had a system like that in America for a very long time until it was transformed in the late 19th century. Because up until the latter half of the 19th century, the common law regarding pollution was that if a factory owner polluted a stream, or the air in a way that caused financial, physical, or psychic harm to his neighbors, uh, it was almost certain that he would be sued for damages by either the individuals or the community, and he would then be found guilty and assessed a penalty. So from the perspective of a business owner, pollution isn't worth it because they'd be held legally responsible for it, and then there's no gain for them in pursuing it. But the legal system in the country changed once it began to adopt a more collectivist philosophy, as opposed to the formerly individualist philosophy, which was that the government's legal system should be based on the protection of life, liberty, and property, which includes protection from externalities such as pollution. But the more collectivist viewpoint that was adopted by the American legal system instead argued that no individual or group of individuals should stand in the way of the progress of the entire community. And because of that, a few victims of the effects of pollution should not interfere with the development that benefits the society or that aids in the greater good. It's just the utilitarian concept of the greater good for the greatest number. And as a result of this, polluters were increasingly let off the hook through the collectivist corruption of our legal system. And there's no incentive to maintain property that doesn't belong to you. The socialists have this vision of utopia in which people will care about property that isn't theirs. People will work to provide for people that they don't know. And as demonstrated by virtually every execution, no pun intended, of their ideology, it never works out that way. Contrast this with a free market economy where people have strong incentives to take care of their property, the key word being their property, but in the same system, business owners have a strong incentive to conserve and protect natural resources. Contrary to the images that they showcase in their propaganda, pollution, and waste, it's very Seussian, you know? It's almost as if they're just trying to recreate the illustrations from the Lorax, that anti-capitalist propaganda. That was actually one of my favorite stories growing up. Actually, it really wasn't anti-capitalist because I've heard it characterized as such. But that critique is really, you know, the green guy was irresponsibly depleting resources and polluting to where the business literally had to shut down. So that's not so much an issue with capitalism as it is with apathy or reckless greed. Because if the green guy, like what's his name, isn't he like chancellor or something? There's a hyphen in it. But if, if, if he wanted to maximize his profits, he would have invested money into planting more trees and then like the lumbering businesses do now because he ended up just driving himself out of business. It was the Onceler. That was it. It was the Onceler. And so that's what we'll do for Earth Day. Was the Lorax a Marxist? An analysis of the Onceler's greed. It's going to be a 53-minute video essay by John Doyle. But that's the content that people want, so we'll do it. But that's basically the point I was trying to make, which is that in order to maximize your profits, you want to use as few resources as possible to create your product or service. And so if you cut costs while maintaining quality, you'll increase your profit. That's why you know you see certain water bottle companies, I think Ice Mountain did this, where they now have a thinner plastic caps on their bottles and they say, oh, it's because we care about the environment. Yeah, no, they don't. It's because they're saving tons of money by using less plastic than beforehand. But you see, and this in all sorts of industries, like forestry, where they plant trees to ensure that they're able to keep foresting into the future. You know, all you really have to do is think about how people treat rental cars versus how they treat their own cars. But renters, at least, can be held accountable. The biggest flaw of government is that it's theoretically supposed to hold itself accountable. It's inherently flawed. And you think that, you know, just socialism, total government control over the economy, you think that's going to help? You're convinced that's going to make things better? You're ignorant. If you believe that, you are ignorant of history, you lack penetrating thought, you're a living symptom of a society that has become too comfortable to be rational out of necessity. A lot of these things, you know, these college kids typically going to college on their parents' dime, maybe they're taking out massive loans, whatever. What happens at college in the communal living areas when someone makes a mess? What happens when someone breaks something? They're held accountable, they're fined, they fix it, perhaps they're ostracized, maybe even all of the above. There's a reason. It's operating on a micro scale. But when something is collectively owned on a large scale, no one has the profit motivation nor the simple pride of ownership to actually care about it being maintained. It's just something expendable that we can use right now. We saw this in the Soviet Union where they exploited the Black Sea in trying to meet government-issued five-year plans for housing. They extracted gravel and sand from around the Black Sea beaches. They knocked down a bunch of trees. Then there was massive erosion of the beach 
Between 1920 and 1960, the coastline shrank by half. The area was scarred by hundreds of landslides every year. And then, of course, hospitals, hotels, all sorts of fun stuff collapsed into the sea as the shoreline gave way. And if you think the water's bad over here in the West, just pick up any 20th century history book about what's going on behind that Iron Curtain because you had the effluent from a chemical plant that killed almost all the fish in the Oka River in 1965 and then similar situations in the Volga, Ab, Yenesi, Ure, Northern Davina Rivers, however they're pronounced, because most Russian factories discharge their waste without cleaning it at all. Mines, oil wells, ships, yeah, they all freely dumped waste into any available body of water. Only six of the 20 main cities in Moldavia had a sewer system by the late 1960s, and only two of them were actually successful at treating sewage. Communist China was the same way. According to the World Watch Institute, by the early 1990s, more than 90% of the trees in the pine forests of China's Sichuan province had died from air pollution. They've killed their crops because of acid rain. They've created deserts in their country because of government depletion of resources. I mean, we could go on and on, but we won't because frankly, it's boring, right? Like after one or two examples, you get the point like, oh, well, the government's bad at doing the things it claims that it will do. Hmm, who'd have thought? But we could go through the same cases in Poland, Czechoslovakia, Venezuela, East Germany. It happens everywhere. And you want to complain about resource exploitation and pollution and then claim capitalism is the problem? Those are symptoms of socialist countries, of countries that have economies controlled by their governments. And then you want to pretend that more government control is the solution? Like, oh, well, in the abstract, I could understand why you might think removing private property incentives and implementing the tragedy of the commons on a national scale might be bad. And I can understand why you might think all those countries that had the same ideas as me were bad for the environment, but here's what you're not taking into account. We're just gonna do it better. Yeah, you know how they didn't do it right? Well, we are going to do it right. So what if it's failed dozens of times? So what if everyone thought that they would be the ones to not fail, the ones that would break the chain? We're actually gonna be the ones to do it because my name is Sydney and I listen to everything that Bill Nye tells me because I never stopped taking him seriously as a scientist even after we stopped watching his VHS tapes in middle school because I'm in my mid-20s and I'm still dependent on my parents and because I never grew up I'm still infatuated with those aspects of my childhood. Hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Also, leave it a comment with your thoughts on the connection between environmentalism and socialism. And you can also subscribe to the channel and turn on post notifications so you get notified when I post. Interesting concept, no? Uh, so anyways, thank you so much for watching and may God bless America, pow, because America's cool. And you know what's not cool? Socialism. It's something to think about. So enjoy the rest of your evening.